It's my pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, Kirsten Conrad, and she will um, introduce a special guest we have joining us as well. Kirsten. Thank you, Leslie. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation on periodical cicada. I'm the extension agent for Arlington County in the city of Alexandria. My program area is agriculture and natural resources. We have a wonderful, wonderful program here in Arlington. I have wonderful speak people to work with. And one of our special guests today is the natural resources manager for Arlington County, Alonzo Abogadas, who is a last minute surprise addition to the program. And we welcome him here today. I, on behalf of the Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Program Organizers um, and our partners, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia Organization, I would really uh, want to welcome you today. A special thank you to um, our facilitators today, Leslie Fillmore, who's our Master Gardener Program Coordinator, as well as Colleen Kennedy, who's on a Master Gardener Volunteer, who's on as um, facilitator, and Amy Crumpton, who is also our Master Gardener Program Public Education Committee Chair. Okay, so we have been inundated so far with information about periodical cicadas. And as a recently published Washington Post article by Dale Fears mentioned, these arthropods have been buried alive for 17 years and are about to emerge. Indeed, starting in April and into May and June of this year, we will get to witness one of the most amazing natural phenomena of the world. As the brood 10 cicadas come out to mate, lay eggs, and complete their above-ground life cycle. Hope you'll enjoy this program today. We're going to be saving the chat box, and you can too if you wish to revisit some of the links and the answers that may be posted into the chat box. We will be taking questions, and Colleen Kennedy will be um, stopping the program from time to time to forward those questions, but we may not be able to get to them all. Um, to ensure that you get to all of your questions, we will be reviewing the chat box afterwards. And you can also send in follow-up questions to our Master Gardener help desk at the email in red on the screen, M-G-A-R-L-A-L-E-X at gmail.com. Today's program, as Leslie said, is being recorded and will be available to view on demand in about a week at the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia.org website in the virtual classroom resources. Today's program it has a, a bit of a, a, a schedule here. We have an introduction, we have a distribution and life cycle section. Uh, damage and management is of course of great interest um, to all of you who are attending. And of course we have some additional resources to mention to you at the end of the program. So this is a lovely aerial view, uh, Monticello. Uh, this is a little bit of a prop here to tell you that Cicada has been around for a very long time. History is full of recorded observations of the human experiences with this North American native. Nowhere else on earth does this kind of cyclical phenomenon occur. And documents gathered by Benjamin Franklin that were recorded in Pennsylvania documented the emergence of, um, from, of cicadas from the ground in large numbers during May of 1715 and 1732. In 1775, Thomas Jefferson recorded in his garden book the 17-year periodicity of brood two's emergence, writing that an acquaintance remembered, quote, great locust years um, in 1724 and 1741. And he and others recalled this in 1754 when the insects that had been emerging from the ground at Monticello um, came out again. He noted that the females lay their eggs in small twigs of trees while above ground. He was a wonderful natural historian that kept wonderful records. And if you've had a chance to read him, he's very great. 1800, Benjamin Banneker, who lived near Ellicott Mills in Maryland, also wrote in his record book that he recalled a great locust year, quote unquote, in 1749 on the second in 1766, in which the insects appeared to be as full as numerous as the first, on the third in 1783. He predicted that, quote, the insects may be expected again in the year 1800, which is 17 years since their third appearance to me. Moses Bartram, who was also a wonderful naturalist, described in his observations on the cicada or locust of America, um, the next appearance of the brood 10. He noted that upon hatching from eggs, and I'm reading this from, from his records, deposited in the twigs of trees, the young insects ran down to the earth 
and entered the first opening they could find. And of course, he reported that he had been able to discover them 10 feet below the surface, but others had reported them much deeper. So this is, represents a phenomenon that the entomologists of the world are ecstatic about. Um, the esteemed entomologist from the University of Maryland, Dr. Mike Ropp, estimates that this, with this blue 10, we could see an emergence of up to 300 nymphs per square yard, or about a million 500,000 per acre. Uh, this represents the highest, the most highest reported biomass values of any naturally occurring terrestrial animal. One question, why did they call the cicadas locusts? This goes back to the first time that a brood was seen by European settlers. And of course, in 1633, in the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts, a large emergence that, that of cicadas that, that came out um, was reported. And it was so, shortly followed by what they called a pestilent fever. I'm sure that we can draw analogies to 2020 that raged through the colony and the Indian neighbors. This was close enough to the biblical plagues that referred to locusts in huge numbers. And as the early colonists were newcomers, brand new, had never seen North America before, the only thing they could compare this to was the locust plagues of the Bible. Unfortunately, the name stuck. Uh, periodical cicadas, no matter which species, are often referred to as locusts. Actual locusts are grasshoppers and belong to the family Orthoptera, while cicadas, by comparison, are true bats, and they are related to leaf hoppers in the family Hemiptera. The three species of 17 year cicadas, um, Magis cicada, Septendissima, which are also called the Favor cicada, the Magicasidum cassini, Magicicata septendifecula in brood 10. These are all three of them are in brood 10, differ in size, color pattern, and song. The same is true for the 13 year cicadas, and the, the three species that are considered 13 year cicadas. They were originally classified as six different species, three 13 year, three 17 year. Uh, as there were no appreciable differences between the 13 and 17 year versions of these three, they have been taxonomically grouped together. And it is now thought likely that there are mainly three species of periodical cicada that make up our Eastern birds. Each of them have a 17 year and a 13 year form and all three of them will emerge as part of bird 10. Although cicadas exist elsewhere in the world, nowhere else do they occur in such large numbers as they do here in the, west, in the eastern part of the United States. They also don't occur in the cyclical pattern so largely as they do in the eastern United States, and they are completely unknown in the western part of the US. The various broods generally have all three species, but in different amounts. And this varies from region to region. DECIM, D-E-C-I-M, referring to both the 17-year septendicum and the 13-year tredicum predominates in the northern area. Cassini, referred to, referring to the Cassini and the Tredeschi Cassini, the 17-year and 13-year, predominates in the Mississippi Valley and the southwestern part of the range. And Decula, referring to the Septendecula and Tridecula is generally rare, but it's most common in the South. But again, all three of these mix together and emerge together during, throughout most of the range of brood 10. There were originally 30 broods of periodical cicada that were defined, including both 17 and 13 year forms. The 13 year cicadas are mainly in the South and um, these broods were poorly defined, many of them, uh, and some of them have gone extinct of these 30. So there are now 15 broods of periodical cicada, 12 of the 17 year, and three of the 13 year. As you can see in this collection of maps, periodical cicadas are limited to Eastern North America. Broods one through 14 are 17 year cicadas, and 19, 22, and 23, the three in the lower right, are 13-year cicadas. Extinct broods include nine, 21, 
and seven, which we will talk about just momentarily, which is declining. Not all of these broods are as problematic or widespread as brood 10. Some broods have a very restricted spread. Brood seven, as we just mentioned, which is declining, last appeared in 2018 and will next come in 2035. But it has a very, very narrow geographic range located near the Finger Lakes in New York. And it is believed to be in decline because of um, lack of you know, food sources, you know, population increase of people, um, development, and so on. It's not just brood 10 that graces us with, our presence, with its presence here in, in Virginia. Another brood that is important to fruit producers in the mid-Atlantic region particularly is brood 2. This brood, which last emerged in 2013, is present from the Hudson Valley in New York down all the way to the northern of parts of North Carolina. It also affects Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. And as you can see, it's, it's also covering areas that are major fruit producing areas like the Shenandoah Valley. Some broods have very significant importance to these commercial fruit growers. Brood 9, by example, appeared in 1986 and 2003 in Southwest Virginia. And while it is not very widespread, it was very, very intense in affected areas. It is likely to be important in Southwest Virginia and adjacent parts of West Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee as well. This map shows the distribution of Brood 9, which doesn't affect us in the um, Washington, D.C. metro area. Brood 10, however, is the broadest, biggest, baddest of the broods and emerges the year after Brood 9. We are in the epicenter of Brood 10's emergence and the concentration of these arthropods in the DC, Maryland and Northern Virginia area will be higher than in many other parts of this map. You can see on this map, it is present in much of the fruit region of the Mid-Atlantic states as well, including the lower Shenandoah Valley, Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, so we get the double whammy, okay, of multiple broods in this area. They will begin to emerge as the soil temperature hits 64 degrees. And as you might imagine, they're going to emerge first in Georgia and work their way up the um, climate um, zones. I have to tell you, my, I grew up originally in Southwest Ohio and you can see the brood turn covers Southwest Ohio as well. Um, and in fact, there's an area of Cincinnati, um, adjacent to Cincinnati, where they have actually achieved those um, 300 you know, incidents, 300 insects per square yard um, density. So I'm well acquainted with the, um, with the charms of these insects. Kirsten, would you mind commenting on the difference between green and red in that map? The red areas represent the areas of the highest density. Um, brood 10 covers all of these areas of the green and red, but the, um, the areas that will have the very, very highest density are marked in red. This map shows the, let's see, the uh, distribution of brood 10 in Virginia. Again, Virginia is going to be, the emergence of them in Virginia is going to be concentrated in the Northern Virginia um, DC area. And we can uh, expect to see them elsewhere, of course, but um, that's going to be where the concentration is. But that's not to say that we don't have some cicadas every single year. In addition to the periodical cicadas, we also have annual cicadas that emerge on an annual basis. And we'll talk about them next. But in summary, the 17 year periodical cicadas that we are going to experience this year from Brood 10 are going to be followed in about seven years, I'm sorry, nine years by Brood 2's emergence in 2030. There are seven described species of periodical cicadas we just talked about the three of the 13 year and three of the 17 year, uh, additional one there, and 28 species of annual cicada found in North America. Periodical cicadas found in Virginia, shown on the left in this image, is typically black with red orange markings um, and red eyes. Nymphs take 17 or 13 years to complete development before they emerge as adults and they emerge in huge numbers, as we just discussed. 
With annual cicadas, the picture on the right, um, even though the adults will emerge every year, the nymphal development still takes two to five years. So even though it's not an, a one year life cycle, you still have some emerging every single year. The broods overlap in time, allowing for this annual emergence. Our typical annual cicadas are black or brown um, with green markings, and they are larger than the periodical cicadas. They emerge later in the season. Um, we may, at the very end of, of the periodical cicadas cycle, see the emergence of the annual cicadas as well. Here's a picture of the periodical cicada life cycle. Um, starting at the upper left, you have the eggs um, that are sort of the, about the size of a grain of rice. Um, the freshly they hatch, the nymph that has, the, has legs that will, can move around and they will scurry down or fall out of the branches that they have been hatched from and, and fall to the ground and begin immediately to burrow down into the ground. This picture shows on the right top right shows the second and third star nymphs. And starting from the left on the bottom, you have the fourth star nymph, as well as the, um, the middle picture shows the emergence of the adult from the, from the nympho egg uh, shell. And on the right, you have the, the adult, the fully formed adult. As I mentioned, the Periodical cicadas emerge after 17 years in the soil. There are also 13 year cicadas, mainly in the south. Um, the adults or the omegas spend their time in trees looking for mates. And that's their main focus. They are looking for a mate. The males appear first. They set up their coursing centers and um, the females respond by twitching in, to when they are ready for mating. Both sexes are attracted to, to this, to the sound, and new males will join in the singing as they emerge. Singing peaks in mid-morning during each day of activity. And while both sexes are attracted and mating takes place in those areas, these coursing centers can shift location, however. So it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon about how they join in and they, 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 the, the choruses are unified. Most people are familiar with the cast nymphal shells the, um, that you pictured on the lower right, um, left behind by the mature nymphs that they have left the soil and emerged as adults. Note the grasping front legs that are used to hold onto the tree or vine roots while feeding. During the time of nymphal development, the insects are consuming sap from the roots of trees and other plants. But once they emerge, it's they do not feed on the plant appreciably. It's normally hard to discern an, uh, an impact because the insects are kind of out of sight. And all the neighboring trees likely have similar nymphal densities in the same symptom. But there are a couple of studies we can draw on. And before we leave this picture, uh, Alonzo has taken a picture of this, the periodical burrows and a molt of a cicada on the left side of this screen. The holes that they emerge from will appear um, um, roughly um, the size of maybe a, as, as large as a dime possibly. And sometimes they will have um, cones of soil or mounds of soil associated with the with the um, holes. But they will also leave sometimes tunnels as well when they're coming up from underneath the ground, something else to, to kind of note. The adult emergence um, will start um, when soil temperature reaches 64 degrees and the nymphs will emerge from the soil at nighttime and crawl onto the trees for adult emergence. Normally they will, they will only look for trees that are about six feet tall and they will be, they will latch on while they, while they emerge from the, from the skins. And um, these pictures were taken by um, out in the, um, the fruit orchards in the, in the um, Shenandoah Valley. There is an impact from root feeding 
and we'll show, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the ground will be covered with these thousands and thousands of caskins, and of course the, the nymphos, nymphs will attach to leaves and stems as they emerge as well. Christine Simon, who is an evolutionary biologist with the University of Connecticut, describes their sounds like this. She says, the first earlier species sounds like a flying saucer landing from a 1950s spaceship. The second one to emerge sounds like someone took water and threw it into hot oil. The last one to emerge sounds like an angry squirrel. And that just cracks me up, but of course they're gonna be very, very loud. Male symbols or male, male cicadas, sorry, alone have the timbre, which is pictured on the left side of this screen. Uh, this is the sound producing membrane that is located on the side of the basal or abdominal segment. This membrane is vibrating, vibrated with muscles and is backed by a resonating chamber, chamber which magnifies the sound. Both sexes, however, have tympanum. And the tympanum is similar to our own eardrum and it's located in a fold on the underside of the abdomen where they can receive these sounds. Both sexes, as it turns out, respond to the singing, leading to local areas of high, high population density. They're drawn to it. Mating sounds can reach up to 100 decibels, equivalent to the sound of a lawnmower or even sometimes a chainsaw, according to Mike Rapp. And cicadas will be drawn to the vibrations of people operating equipments like this. So here's a picture of what they have come above ground specifically to do. And um, the mating is their main biological focus of their time above ground. They don't bite you, they don't sting you, they don't want to do anything except find a member of the opposite sex, mate and lay eggs. Here you can see the female in the process of laying eggs in a peach branch. She starts to lay eggs about two weeks after emergence, uh, mating, and 10 to 25 eggs are inserted into a series of scars that are made by the ovipositor of, um, that the female has on her body. These scars, these slits in the wood, uh, can be injurious to the tree. And uh, even though each female mates only once, they can produce up to about 500 eggs, and we'll lay them in clutches of 10 to 25 eggs per slit. These images shows the eggs in overposition scar, and these are pictures are by Doug Pfeiffer, by the way, who's with the uh, an entomologist with Virginia Tech. The middle picture shows the um, the, the damage that's done to the side of a grapevine, and on the picture on the right, you can see the eggs developing inside the, the um, damaged wood that is um, on the stem. The ovipositor is the part of the female body which does the damage to the plants. The females lay the eggs um, through this egg laying tube called the ovipositor, which rests when it's not in use in a slit underneath the underside of the abdomen. When she is ready to lay eggs, the ovipositor drops down, as you can see in these images, and you can see the sharp um, point on the picture on the right of the business that does the damage to the, um, to the wood. The egg laying will take place over about over several weeks, um, one to two weeks, but the active adults will be active for six weeks. The eggs will hatch about six to 10 weeks after being laid. And the first instar or the first stage of, de of development um, is when the nymphs will drop to the ground and tunnel to the roots where they begin to feed. Mortality, as you might imagine, is fairly high in these first few weeks, but then it drops to very low levels once they fall to the ground and begin to burrow down. The females, lay their eggs, ovipositor, and do not remate. Once they have laid their eggs, they, they generally live out their life and will be gone you know, within six weeks of emergence. Males, however, continue to pursue prospective mates and they can mate more than once. 
The eggs again are laid in twigs about pencil diameter. And this is really important to the nature of the injury to fruit trees and other trees as we'll discuss later. The eggs will hatch in about six weeks and they will um, leave behind these slits that you see in the picture, in both pictures here, where the wood has been lifted in order to deposit the eggs down into the stem. Your garden plants are going to be okay, really, okay? The adults may suck some sap, but this is not harmful. The primary damage is going to come from the damage that they do when laying eggs into the branch. They are going to look for branches that are about um, the diameter of a pencil. And they're going to spe be specifically looking for plants that are usually about six feet high. So that's limiting it to trees. They may also feed on um, feed on roots in the ground for 17 years, which we'll talk about, but you also may get some overpositing on some of the tall stem perennials, plants, and so on that are present. Kirsten, Here's I'm sorry, yes. there was a question specifically about roses. Do you have any comment about rose plants? Well, there is a possibility that um, roses may be uh, targeted. It's not the primary choice, but roses that have a diameter of a branch that's six, that are the size of a pencil um, may end up with some damage, yes. So there are some groups of trees that we know are rarely or never damaged. Um, evergreens almost never be, uh, are chosen as places to lay eggs. Um, sumac, Osage orange, euonymus, viburnum, and pawpaws are particularly I won't say safe, that's not quite the right word, but they are not chosen, they're not preferred choices for egg laying. Trees that are often damaged include our, you know, many of our shade trees, oaks, elms, maples, many of our fruit trees are, are particularly favored because the bark is thin and easily um, cut open for the egg laying. Peaches, um, hickory ash, chestnut, and cherry are all going to be trees that are preferred for egg laying. But most especially, the newly planted young trees are the ones that are going to show the most damage. Why is that? Because they are, have a majority of the branches that are pencil sized, okay? If they, take, if, they, if they lay eggs on every single pencil sized branch on a young tree, you can have severe damage to that tree. So they have a very wide host range. Um, conspicuous injury um, can occur on apple, oak, or even grapevines, and representatives of three very different families. Okay, right there. Some hosts are too gummy for acceptance. Pine, for example, and the evergreens have a resinous sap, which is, which is not um, conducive to um, effective egg laying. Peach is acceptable for overposition, but it's still not ideal. And there is some mortality of egg masses that occur. The economic impact um, of overposition is certainly influenced by the growth pattern of the host. For example, in large and mature apple trees, the flagging, and the flagging refers to the depth of the ends of the branches that are killed beyond the point of the overpositing egg laying. The deaths of those branches, what's called flagging, the tips of those branches, they may be limited to those tips and beyond the fruit and be not as significant, but some, some pruning, some apple tree, apple growers are allowed to lose any part of their tree. And so controls are often affected, um, affected by fruit growers more often than those who are growing and responsible for ornamentals. Here's a picture of what flagging looks like. Uh, when the cicadas deposit their eggs in the series of slits in the wood, the length of branch beyond this point often dies. Different trees respond a little bit differently, but in fruit trees, oak, and many others, brown flagging is apparent in the tree within a matter of weeks. This is not serious in mature trees because the injury is at the ends of the branches and it will be effectively simply pruning the ends of the branches off. 
On a young tree, the preferred pencil diameter size branches make up the main portion of the tree. And um, on a young tree that's being trained for fruit production, this can be very serious. It can upset the training pattern of the tree. Likewise, on grapevines and the trunks of young vines are particularly susceptible. As we talked about earlier, peach is not an ideal host. Its sap is gummier than some others, um, but females will still lay eggs in the branches. And you can see the flagging at the ends of the branches when the section of the branch dies. Even though overpositing often kills the ends of branches when eggs are being laid, it does not all, it's not always true that you need to be pruned away and it's not always true that they would die and fall off. Sometimes those branches do survive. Pruning away branches that are injured may reduce some of the population of nymphs in future years, but you should only prune if the branches die. Here's a little bit of a review of what happens when the cicadas do their root feeding. This study that was done in the Hudson Valley um, used sheets on the ground to um, collect the first star nymphs from reaching the roots of the tree, okay? And they did note that um, on the protected trees, that, that was, there was an increase in the annual wood accumulation in the following year. So the feeding of the nymphs was determined to have some impact on the development and growth of new wood. It was not impactful to justify major work done to control the nymphs. There has been shown to be a relationship of flagging with an increase in fire blight in some Asian pear trees. The fire blight again is a, is a, um, a disease which is transmitted um, from tree to tree. And as the, as the overpositing occurs from one tree to another, the disease can be spread from one tree to another. But again, there's tremendous variation among varieties, and this is not thought to be a significant enough um, cause to, to be of concern. Another study looked at um, the complications from flagging as a function of the spread of heartwood decay that might enter the tree from the wound that was caused by the dead branch and the, and the injury. The, um, Healing of overpositioned wounds during the two years that the study was conducted varied depending on the species or the cultivar that was involved, from none to rough partial healing with stunted growth and reduced flowering to rapid healing and complete recovery. So, again, uh, the rejuvenation of the top branch um, was accomplished by pruning out the injured or the dead branches, and the pruning stimulated lateral growth and uh, force new lateral branches to grow and recover from the, from the effect of the um, overpositioning. So let's look for a few minutes at the potential for biological control of periodical cicadas. Um, there is a wasp, the range of predators that attack these insects. There are some um, wasps that attack the eggs while they are in the host plant, still embedded in those slits. This is a very large group of egg parasitoids that attack a wide range of hosts, not just cicadas. They don't really impact the populations of cicadas, um, but they are nice to know that they're hard at work looking after us. After emerging from the soil, the um, nymphs are um, uh, attacked by a multitude of other living organisms. Moles are important predators of nymphs. Um, we will expect to see a, 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 an expansion of, of mole population after um, this year. When above ground, you have ants, spiders, and centipedes that will attack the nymphs. And of course, interestingly, there is a fungal pathogen called Massospora cicadina, which occurs in the soil that spreads from the nymphs to the adults. This is also called the flying salt shaker of death. And if you look, if you Google that, you should find some interesting pictures. But essentially in stage one of this disease, the fungus alters the normal cicada response to mating. What this fungus does is it eats away at the um, genitals of the both of uh, cicadas of both sexes. 
and they essentially lose their ability to mate. In stage two, which is the next stage of infection, the, um, the, both the females and the males are affected and the males would still do have been observed to respond as females would have. But in the first stage, uh, the males can sometimes spread the disease by being attracted to other males. Um, because of the activity of mating more than once, this disease spreads rampantly throughout the population. Since the infection renders them sterile, one would expect that the selection would lead to females avoidance of infected males, but there is no evidence that female magisicata are capable of identifying and avoiding infected males, so the disease remains alive within the population. Lots of control agents for adults exist. Chickens, pets, other insects. Most important of these are the birds. Red-winged blackbirds, starlings, and several other species feed on cicada adults. Among the mammals, there are squirrels, cats, dogs, possums, raccoons, and so on that feed on these insects. And even reptiles get in on the act. They, including turtles and snakes, that find these to be very delectable food. Cicada killers are large wasps that specialize in cicadas, but they typically don't emerge until after the periodic cicada life cycle has been completed. Remember the main evolutionary reason for the 17 or 13 year life cycle and synchronized mass emergence is ultimately survival. And the one of the reasons they survive is through something called predator satiation. These predators feed on many cicadas when they first show up, but there's no way they can keep up with the massive adult emergence. And of course, thousands and thousands of them survive. The University of Maryland's Department of Agriculture and Immunologist Gay Williams describes it as being similar to when we are invited to eat at an all-you-can-eat crab feast. Everyone eagerly grabs the first batch, and you take every last bite of that. By the time the fourth tray comes around, people only take the claws. After a while, you're full. Predator association is a survival strategy and loss of even thousands of these to predators will not stop bird tenor at all. But a good meal will mean that these animals will enjoy a good life. And the numbers of their offspring will increase this year as well. Now, your pet dog may also throw up a few as he chows down on the crispy shells of these mature cicadas. But the good news is they're not poisonous to dogs or cats or people. So predator association works in the main emergence areas. Um, there are dramatic numbers attacking fruit plantings and other shade trees. Um, there's some evidence that the more important predation of, is of the small birds that, and the stragglers that come out every year. With those sort of reinforce the synchronized nature of the emergence. But these emergences um, um, support the idea of their value for ecosystem support and their success of being one of the longest lived insects on earth uh, is, is certainly supported by the fact that they have learned how to come out in such large numbers that they are not, um, not, not um, done away with in great, great enough numbers to threaten the bird. Okay, let's talk about controls. Colleen, how we're doing? Uh, we're doing well. There was um, there were a lot of questions about individual plants, and I think I would assume you would just say anything that has a pencil-sized uh, branch might be at risk if it were young. Uh, there were That's... questions about hydrangeas, um, all different service berries, different kinds of trees, but I would think that maybe you would just give that general answer. Um, right. There was a question about when, if you were someone who was going to wrap your tree to protect it, your young tree, when is the risk over and when can you unwrap them, particularly if you're worried about hurting birds? Right. The, we'll talk about the netting as we, in just a little while. We're, we're getting ready to talk about that section, but essentially you can finish that wrapping and that protection by 
the middle of June or so, okay? Okay, there have been lots of questions, but Alonzo is, your wingman is handling them. <laughs> There's okay. lots of questions to go because I'm very slow at typing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So since biological control is generally insufficient, there are three different avenues of other controls that are possible that you might be consider. The first is cultural control. Don't plant the year before the emergence. And some um, growers of fruit trees suggest that even two years before an major emergence is too soon. Schedule your tree purchases with the nursery and plantings to, to take place after the cicada emergence is finished. Um, so planting in this coming fall would be a good time. In the fall is generally a better time to plant trees than in the springtime anyway. So carry on. Uh, physical control involves excluding them from the places that you don't want them to be. And if you're going to use a netting, it can't be any greater than a one quarter inch mesh um, that, in order for it to work. Chemical controls are not recommended for home use. They are disruptive to the populations of natural enemies. They are toxic to applicators and to the environment. And they are sometimes injurious to the crop or tree. The main problem with chemical controls for cicadas is that they are not, any, anything that's going to control cicadas is going to have significant um, consequences for non-target populations of beneficial insects. Uh, we just don't normally recommend this time, these recommend pesticides for cicada use at all. There's a product called Kaolin, um, which is approved as a, um, a, a preventive measure for excluding periodic cicada from fruit. It is a, um, an OMRI approved control, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second. Small ornamental trees, shrubs, and fruit trees may be protected by covering them with insect netting sold in garden centers, nurseries, hardwares, and of course, online. In 2004, uh, we observed that the insect netting with openings ranging from 0.25 inches to 0 0.40 inches prevented injury to small trees very effectively. Bird netting openings that are too large to exclude cicadas. The fabric called tulle, T-U-L-L-E, is readily available fabric that can be draped over small or newly planted trees. Um, a netting um, that any kind of fabric um, that you can use that is um, smaller, has a mesh that's smaller than half an inch should be effective. The plants should be protected from the time the cicadas emerge until they are gone six to eight weeks later. So starting from the third or fourth week of April, you need to leave that mesh on no longer than the time when the cicadas have completed their life cycle, somewhat about mid-June at the latest. The pictures show different kinds of exclusion products that you can purchase. Um, if you use any of the netting type materials on your plants, you need to be aware that birds and sometimes snakes and other animals can get trapped in the netting. And you should be checking these from time to time to make sure that, um, they, that others have not inadvertently become trapped. If you use um, the, the bottom of the netting should be fastened down to the ground and weighted down with bricks or some other product that is going to limit um, creatures from crawling underneath or up underneath the netting. And of course, um, the example on the uh, bottom left, you could still have cicadas hatching from the ground, um, which is inside that netted area. This material in the middle here called tree wrap um, will protect trunks of young trees. And I do recommend that. But again, usually a trunk of a tree, even a young, newly planted tree is going to be much larger um, than the pencil size thickness of the preferred size of the uh, material for overpositing. And of course, if you go out, you may wish to have some personal protection. 
um, which ranges, you know, from all over body netting. Uh, and of course, if you've been thinking about buying a patio enclosure, this would be the year to do it. There was some research that suggests that um, this OMRI approved product called Surround, um, that's, a, well, that's the trade name, which is a kale and clay suspension can be used to deter not only cicada damage, but overpositing, but also stink bug and borer feeding on food and um, um, young wood. This is a clay, uh, a mineral product that is mixed up into a slurry, into a suspension inside your spray container. And you can spray it onto your tree. It will eventually wash away with rain. And a coating of this is unappetizing to insects, and it may deter some um, overpositor damage. So a few more thoughts on protection. Remember, damage is done by the egg laying process. Cicadas do not feed on the trees or plants in any appreciable way that will harm them. They're not going to eat your vegetables. They're not gonna eat their bedding plants. They, um, uh, you're not going to have any control that you need to do for cicadas on older established trees. You will get some flagging, you will get some damage on the ends of branches, but again, the um, control is, is just going to be um, not necessary. You do need to protect young trees and delay the planting of them until the fall if you can. And if you can wrap or um, exclude cicadas from the young branches, that would be desirable. Remember that insecticides are ineffective and they cause harm to non-target populations. And they're generally not going to, just going to be a waste of money and time. You ought to cover your ornamental ponds with some kind of screening material. The aggregation of large numbers of dead cicadas um, in small ponds can cause an oxygen um, depletion and can harm the fish in the ponds. So cover your ornamental ponds. Clean your pool skimmers and filters frequently. Um, you're going to get dead cicadas in your open ground water areas, including swimming pools. Uh, you're going to need to, you're going to also have to protect the helpers, okay, which means that um, all the animals, all the birds, the creatures that are going to help you with your, um, with the control of the cicadas, try not to harm them in any way. Most importantly, you should enjoy this rare, spectacular, and cyclical phenomenon. It occurs nowhere else on Earth in the kinds of quantities we're going to see. Remember, the damage is done by the egg-laying process. Cicadas do not sting, they don't bite people, and they're quite harmless. One entomologist said, this is better than even monarchs. Now, you may not agree, and you may choose not to want to have this kind of infestation in your property or around your houses, but this is so cool. I mean, you know, imagine something in suspended development for 17 years that emerges. It's better than Han Solo frozen in carbonite. At any rate, I want you to enjoy this, um, this experience this year. Could you use the cicada carcasses in compost or mulch? Oh, yes. Yeah, there, it's, it's a chitinous material that is going to decay along with, with everything else. It's completely safe to use, and you don't need to worry about it um, um, causing any kind of adverse effects in, okay, to okay. your plants. Thank you. And certainly, you know, as you fish out the dead insects from your ponds and your, fishing, your swimming pools and so on, um, or rake them up off the ground, yes, absolutely, put them in the compost pile. And when would you unwrap your trees? Ah, the trees should remain wrapped if you choose to do that for the duration of the, um, the life cycle above ground. So we're looking at from sometime the end of April, third week of April, until the second week of June, give or take. Okay, that's great. Thank you. If you wrap your trees, you should minimize the time that they're wrapped. The wrapping is, um, well, it's hard to do, first of all. It's hard on you. And it's also hard on the trees. So try, I had one call from someone who was worried about wrapping the trees because it would pose potentially a larger 
uh, wind sail, and they were worried about the trees becoming damaged from wind while they were wrapped up in this um, in this um, cover. And my advice was simply to stake the trees and for the time that they're, they're covered and hope for the best. So uh, there's lots and lots of material for you to learn more. Um, one of the really coolest sites uh, for you to check out is something called Cicada Mania, cicadamania.com, uh, which has everything from recipes to how to keep cicadas as pets for a short time. Uh, these are fabulous resources for children. They're friendly, if they're not very smart, because they sometimes mistake your arm or your leg for a tree branch looking for some sap. They are large and easily observed, and they're, they're just uh, very, very cool. There's heaps of things you can do with the shells, and I know that uh, one craft project advised spraying them with silver or gold paint and letting the kids make craft projects out of them. I'm depending on all of you to help educate others. Adults and children alike about the wonders of nature and not to be afraid of insects. The only damage cicadas cause is to woody plants that serve as hosts for egg laying habits. The female cicadas use that appendage, again, in, in summary, called the ovipositor to gouge those longitudinal slits into which they deposit eggs. That ovipositor cannot harm people. Uh, adults do not feed on leaves. And cicadas pose no health threat to people or pets. They don't sting, they don't bite, they're not poisonous. In fact, uh, the only concern might be that the consumption of large numbers of these insects by your dogs or your cats might act as irritants to their stomachs and cause them to throw up. But they are edible and people can eat them. Uh, they are low in fat, low in carbohydrates, high in protein, and definitely gluten-free. There are some websites here for, um, for recipes that you can find online. University of Maryland has a cicada cookbook that offers 15 different recipes for cooking and enjoying periodical cicadas. Everything from soft-shelled cicadas and Maryland cicadas, of course, seasoned with Old Bay, to sicka delicious pizza and banana cicada bread. The cookbook does, however, advocate that um, eating cicadas should be done after consulting with your doctor. <laughs> anyway, there's chocolate covered cicadas, there's cooking and enjoying periodical cicadas, um, all kinds of recipes for you to enjoy these guys. Dr. Green, Jean Kritsky, who um, wrote this book right here called Periodical Cicadas, the Brood 10 edition, is the originator of the Cicada Safari. And the Cicada Safari is an online um, research project and mapping project that you can participate in. You can download the, um, the, the, the app from both the Mac and the Google Play App Store and enter your sightings of cicadas to the map, uh, to the map app. University of Connecticut also maintains a Brood 10 map that is um, readily available to anybody who wants to go to the website to look at it. Cicada Safari, Gene Kwitski is, is, is a renowned um, expert on um, Kwitski, Kwitski is his name, is a renowned expert on cicadas and um, detailed um, a town called Delhi in Ohio that actually did have those 300 insects per square yard emerge during the last cicada emergence. I want to acknowledge three people who have um, offered um, advice and expertise here. Doug Pfeiffer from the University of Virginia Tech um, from the Department of Entomology um, does the Virginia Fruit Page. And this is a, uh, a fabulous site that offers a wealth of information to fruit growers of all kinds in Virginia. And he has a blog spot, a blog that has uh, information about cicadas and a, a special um, you know, information page that will help you with additional information about the effects of the fruit trees. Lonzo Abogados, who's on here, is gonna join me in answering questions, is, is gonna help you out here too. And of course, Dale Fears uh, wrote this fabulous Washington Post article recently on, uh, on uh, cicadas that I believe it was last Monday. And so uh, do check it out. 
So there several questions about pollination of fruit trees if they're covered with netting. Could you comment on that? Yes, I, I'm, I'm happy to do so. And obviously, yes, netting is going to um, stop pollination. Um, I, I, there's no two ways about it. You, you can go out and inspect your trees every day and try to remove the cicadas that are emerging prior to the time that they lay their eggs. You can do pruning afterwards, but this is a year when you may not get, you have to choose maybe between fruit and cicadas. You can hand pollinate your flowers um, simply by transferring pollen with a hand brush or something like that, Q-tip or whatever. Uh, but if you feel like you must cover your, your trees um, with netting, then you will have to um, in, uh, you know, take on some other tasks to enable pollination. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions about whether the fungal disease that affects them can affect other creatures. Uh, I, it, it does not, it's specific to cicadas, thus the name in their name is what, secadania or whatever. So it's yeah. specific to cicadas and nothing else. Okay, I think those were the only questions that were unanswered. Wonderful. Uh, we have um, the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia have got a fabulous website if you've never been there before. And of course you all of you have because you registered for this class. Um, but there is a public education page there for upcoming public education. There's something called the virtual classroom tab, which is where we store all the saved presentations that are available um, on demand. Um, there's a wealth of programming there. Um, there is something really a wonderful feature that they have on the website. It's called the Tried and True Native Plants Fact Sheets. And of course, there's information about our six demonstration gardens on this page as well. Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, also provides soil test kits and information for those seeking to test their soil. Uh, there are um, lists of locations where you can pick up a soil test kit, and we provide assistance to those who wish to have um, help with the interpretation of the soil test results. Finally, there is a um, Extension Master Gardener help desk, which operates by email only right now because our offices are still closed due to COVID. Uh, and they, they can be accessed with any questions, follow-up questions from today's presentation or any question about um, home garden um, or you know, um, tree production or culture at the M-G-A-R-L-A-L-E-X at gmail.com website email. Finally, I just want to give a shout out to um, some folks that are helping us out tremendously. Um, Virginia Cooperative Extension is facing a possibly 50% um, cutback in our budget funding this year from Arlington County. And if you enjoyed today's presentation, we hope that you will let them know. Um, letters need to be sent by April 6th to the county board at arlingtonva.us. Well, if you have questions, you can contact Caitlin Verdu with her email, cverdu at vt.edu. I wanna thank you all for your attention today and for your, for your presence and for your advocacy for cicadas and all um, natural phenomena. We need your help. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to Kirsten Conrad, our extension agent for the Arlington Alexandria Master Gardeners, and she does much more than that, let me tell you. And we are so thrilled to have Alonzo Abogadas here with us today. It was great having you answering those questions in the chat. 